Christmas greetings to you and thank you for joining us today. Let me also say thank you for being a part of uh, the Newton Park Methodist Church community in this way over the past year. We're glad you're with us on this Christmas day. You may or may not know that uh, quite a lot of the Christmas story, not all of it obviously, but there are large parts of it that are just made up. And it's often the made up bits I find that people probably like the best and defend the most. Let me explain what I mean. Sometimes they're poets and musicians and artists and storytellers who take a good story and try to make it better to borrow from the Beatles. So you know, they embellish the story a bit, they throw a donkey in here or a cow in there and so on to make the story quaint or sentimental or something. And sometimes preachers also have to add things to what they read in scripture, not so much to embellish on the story, but because the Bible is often in such an economical and careful way we sometimes have to try and join the dots and we have to try and work out the background and the context of what we are reading. So I get why we have fallen into the habit of making things up when it comes to the scriptures. But when we do that, we actually have to be very careful because the real story, what is on the page, is, is almost always far more daring, far more exciting than the one we try to create or embellish upon. Can I give you a few examples from the Christmas story? I've shared some of these over the years past, but let me just share them again. All that the Bible tells us is that Jesus, in our reading today, all that the Bible tells us is that Jesus was laid in a manger. That's it. It says nothing about a stable or lowing cattle and the baby awakes, as the hymn says, or any animals for that matter being present at the birth of Jesus. We've just made some assumptions because there's a manger that these other things happen. We join the dots. Uh, one of my favorites, because people are surprised when they discover it, is that the Bible tells us that the Magi, sometimes called the three wise men, but the Magi brought three gifts to Jesus. And we assumed that because there were three gifts, that there were three wise men. The only problem is that, that the, the Magi were part of the academic class of Persia. And we know, out of records, we know that the uh, that the Magi were made up of both male and female, men and women Magi. So for all we know, there might have been 20 Magi who traveled to come and see this newborn king, and they just happened to bring three gifts. So in essence, we've made up the bit about the three wise men. It's a form of invention. It's a, it's a bad join-in of the dots. And then there's this other famous made-up bit. It's the one we're most concerned with today. And it's about Mary and Joseph arriving in Bethlehem. Many nativity plays or Christmas cards show a heavily pregnant Mary sitting on a donkey with Joseph walking alongside her, often with some kind of stick or crook in his hand. And they knock on the door of the local Bethlehem Hotel where the innkeeper, who is often short, round and bald, tells them that there is no room in the inn. And well, all of that kind of a picture is actually pretty much made up because this is what our reading from Luke tells us today is what actually happened. In verse 6 it says, while they were there, important phrase while they were there the time came for her Mary to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn that's it now I know many of us would love to have a very pregnant Mary sitting on a donkey with Joseph by her side arriving at midnight with a light fog and a gentle rain standing outside the inn with the little bald round man wagging his finger and sending them on their way. But it's not what's in scripture. We read, while they were there, the time came for her to deliver a child. In other words, in other words, they had been in town for a while. And then the time eventually comes for Mary to have her baby. There's no urgent late night arrival. Um, Nazareth is 145 kilometers from Bethlehem and people could walk that distance in four days, but they usually gave themselves a week uh, to cover the ground. And so it's just common sense that Mary could not have done that trip in the last stages of her pregnancy. So Mary and Joseph had wisely traveled well before giving birth and had arrived in Bethlehem and while they were there, Jesus was born. So maybe there was a donkey to help her whenever she traveled and maybe not. And I know that that's not important, but just to make the point that sometimes we try to embellish or add or join the dots in ways that aren't important. What is far more important for us to know though in the story is this. That that word, that uh, in our sentence today finished with the word in, that that word in, in the Greek, is the word kataluma. 
And the best translation, and I won't go into the reasons why it is the best translation, but the, but the best translations of this tell us that that wasn't uh, an accurate, it's not the best word for us to use, because kataluma actually means a guest room in a private dwelling. Kataluma, a guest room in a private dwelling. It's not intended to express a hotel or an inn. And, and quickly before I go on, let me say to you, the most common arrangement in a home in that time, uh, not so much of the wealthy wealthy, but of an average home at that time, would be the front of the house had the living quarters for the people. And then at the back of the house, often dug at a lower level, was the shelter for the family's animals. So if we put some of this information together, no donkeys, cattle or innkeepers, this is what we end up with. We're told that Joseph has traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem because that is his hometown for the census. So the people there would have known him and they would have known his family in some way. Maybe not everyone, but there had to be people there who knew Joseph. This is his hometown. He's no stranger to the town. And so it is these people who know him, who have no room, who have no guest room for him and his pregnant fiance. It's them who turn their, him, them away. Uh, and, and this is a bit of joy in the dots. This is a bit of, but I think it's reasonable guesswork on our part. But almost certainly they would have been shunning Mary and Joseph for what they would have assumed were either Mary or Mary and Joseph's loose morals. There was even a rumor in the first century that Mary had been raped by a Roman soldier, and that was the cause of her pregnancy. So too afraid of being sullied by this morally compromised couple, Joseph's hometown turned their back on them. Except, except for one. But now I don't want to be unkind because we're very grateful that that one person was gracious enough to take in this family. But even that brave, kind person who let them stay in the animal shelter at the back of their house may not have been as entirely kind as we think they were after all. Because, think with me, see if you agree, which host, however kind, chooses to, to sleep in his own bed instead of giving it up for a woman who is about to give birth? What kind of people live in a home and leave a pregnant woman who's come to take some shelter there, leave the pregnant woman to give birth in the animal shelter while they stay tucked up in their own warm beds? I mean, who does that? Why did no one give up their bed for them? Uh, you know, I'm sure you won't like some of the answers. I know I don't. What kind of person leaves a pregnant woman to give birth in an animal shelter? I suppose one of the answers, one of the most truthful answers we could give, it would have to be people like you and me. Because I think we all do it in one way or another. I know it's Christmas and I know we, we want to be cheerful. I don't say this to make you guilty. I just, I just want to say that this illustrates for us that the world into which Jesus was born and the world in which we continue to live even 2,000 years later is a world in which some of us do go to comfortable warm beds with full stomachs each night while there are others a lot of others who scramble for shelter and food every day and who end up eating often where the animals eat we live in a world structured against the poor and you and i whether we like it or not are participants in that structure we could be the people who leave a pregnant woman to give birth in an animal shelter. What kind of person needs a pregnant woman to give birth in an animal shelter? Well, I suppose another answer would be our public health care system here in South Africa. I'm not sure when you last were in a government hospital. And I, let me quickly add here, I know that there's some very good people, some very good doctors, very good nurses and administrators who are involved in our, in our um, national health system. But, but, I, but I tell you, some of, some of our government hospitals are just nothing short of terrifying. And I feel deeply that it should be mandatory, it should be part of what happens when you go into government, is that the politicians need to eat what they serve, while our leaders are busy sending their children to private schools and send their spouses and themselves to private hospitals, and sometimes they even travel to international hospitals, the majority of the citizens in this country are left to grab the scraps of an overwhelmed and often mismanaged healthcare system. It's unacceptable. 
And may I gently remind you that the former Minister of Health, who recently was a candidate for president, was implicated in the theft of millions of rands in the midst of a global pandemic. The Minister of Health involved with that kind of stuff in the midst of a pandemic. That's the definition of what it means to leave a pregnant woman to give birth in an animal shelter. And of course, uh, our, the answer to our question has to include as well that despite significant progress in the world, and there has been significant progress, our world remains structured not only against the poor, but also still uh, prejudiced against women. Many nations are still designed in a way, whether it's economically or socially, but are still designed in a way to relegate women to the back room of society. Misogyny and gender-based violence plague our world, and the reality is too terrible to contemplate. It really is. If you give yourself a moment to think of what goes on in our country every day to women and children, it is just too terrible to contemplate. Could I give you just one statistic, just as an example? Did you know that 41% of rapes reported in South Africa are of children under the age of 18? 41%, nearly half of all reported rapes in South Africa are of children, and mostly girl children, obviously. God have mercy on us. And I know our time is short and I shouldn't go off on these tangents, but to say the church has a great deal of repenting to do for the role that we have played in harming women. Like Adam, we are fond of blaming Eve for all the troubles of the world. And there are still parts of our church, even in the 21st century, which are particularly keen on wanting women to be silent in church and to submit to men. God, God have mercy on us. I was so determined, as I said a moment ago, I was so determined to preach a happy sermon on this Christmas day. But I kept on ending up with this stuff. And I was thinking, these poor people who watch this video, these poor people who come to church on Christmas Day, and they're coming to celebrate the birth of Jesus, and they get bombarded by all this doom. But then, as I was thinking that, this deep sense of worship settled on me. I found myself saying something like, Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son. Thank you. Just a deep sense of worship. And I was quite puzzled, in truth, at the moment. Because in my thinking, I've just been reminded of my own complicity in neglecting the poor, of the corruption of those who lead our country, the terrible tragedy of violence against women and children. I go, I wonder why, I wonder where the sense of worship comes from. And then I realized that Christmas is for those who have come to know, those who connect with, those who deeply understand that there is nothing we can do to save ourselves. That, that we can do nothing in the end to save ourselves. And this is the season, the reminder, that we have not been abandoned and that we are not left alone to face these things and that we do have a Savior. It can be hard to believe in the midst of things like this, but that we do have a Savior and that we really, really are not without hope. And that God is able through us to do far more than we can even ask or imagine in our broken world, our broken but beautiful world. And also that if God can use a baby to save the world, he definitely can use what little I bring to do something in his name for this broken world. And, and, and it reminds me of that promise this Christmas. He reminds me of that promise, the little I bring God can use. And then maybe when we do that, perhaps together, we can just, we can resolve to stop kicking pregnant women and people like them into the back room. Maybe. Maybe. I wish you a Merry Christmas and God bless you.